Well, here we are for the next installation, the next installment of our Bible study on Genesis. We are starting chapter 4. Adam lay with his wife Eve. Now, first of all, Adam means man, and it also is Adama. Closely associated with Adama means earth. Okay. So, mankind, the man was taken from the earth. And so there's a play in words in Hebrew on that. So the man lay with his wife, Eve. But previously they have uh, said that he called his wife Eve because she was the mother of the living. So now we can treat these as being proper names and not only descriptions. So it's not only the man lay with the mother of the living, but it's Adam lay with Eve, his wife Eve. Notice also lay with Okay, this is, of course, a euphemism. They're not just lying down together, but it's a euphemism like, uh, not as nice as the one that King James Adam knew his wife. A sex should be done in this uh, context of marriage, of course, but not only in the context of marriage, but in the context of knowing somebody well. And uh, and so that word has a, it's a euphemism, yes, but it also has a deeper hint of uh, what a deeper relationship should be with his wife she is now considered to be his wife and this act of sex is an act of marriage so much so that um, when you have sex with somebody other than your wife that is the grounds for the breakup of the pre of the present marriage and uh, because you have committed the marriage act with someone else. So you have broken the marriage contract, the marriage compact with the one to which you were presently married. He lay with his wife, Eve. And oh, by the way, the text for that as uh, for infidelity being the cause, that's from Jesus Christ who said that except for infidelity, uh, that we were not to break up a marriage. Adam lay with his, and, and not to break up a marriage and remarry after that to somebody else. Adam lay with his wife, Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain, or as some languages would pronounce it, Cain. Uh, the A-I diphthong is pronounced with an I sound in English, such as an aisle of an auditorium, but the uh, here in English we usually call this man Cain. But please be aware that people who transliterate in other languages directly from Hebrew and don't have a preset established pronunciation uh, are just translating it the Hebrew way. This is true of many Hebrew words. Uh, for example, you will find uh, in, in the South India, uh, they will say Yohanan instead of John. Well, guess what? Johannan is how it's said, how it's written in the original. So uh, uh, John is an English pronunciation. So uh, when you hear people read a Bible in another language and you hear the names pronounced differently, consider that perhaps those different pronunciations might be the correct ones and the English ones may be uh, incorrect, such as uh, Jesus. Now, the, this letter, J, this sound, J, this modern English, J, isn't even in Old English. If you look in a, in a, 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 a facsimile edition of the King James Version, you will see there aren't any J's in there. 400 years ago, there, was no, there were no J's in the, in the language. And that sound wasn't pronounced that way either. Yehovah, Yahweh. Yo, Yesu, Johan, Jacob, and so on, Yoda. So that, so some of these other nations are pronouncing these names correctly, and we can learn from them. She said, Eve said, I, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. And later she gave birth to his brother, Abel, or Abel. Now it's interesting, uh, I don't know if they knew this was going to happen. There, when you have a first birth, and this is the first human birth, uh, you may not be one know that that was going to take place. Of course, you have the, they have the examples of the animals before them who have given birth, so they may see from that and in 
and imply, oh, that's what will happen in our case too. But if they didn't, it could have been an amusing surprise. As I remember when I had a cat, uh, Joey, Josephine for short, okay, uh, Joey for short for Josephine. When she had her first kittens, she seemed to be totally nonplussed and unaware of what they, of what this was like and what what were these things coming out of her. What were these little furry things? So um, she didn't. She had no mothering instincts whatsoever. She would roll over and, and stifle a kitten, which we, of course, we had an elaborate funeral uh, presided over by my aunt Fern uh, and uh, buried the kitten in a shoebox. No, uh, she said, with the help of the Lord, I brought forth a man. And she, then she gave birth to his brother, Abel, Abel. Now, Abel, Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. This is the first division of labor. And it is the first hint at what we are going to see going through this chapter of the buildup of civilization. First of all, Abel is keeping flocks and Cain is working the soil. Now, when they were in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve weren't working the soil. Remember, work came as a punishment for what they had done wrong. Before, what we would call them in anthropology is gatherers. They weren't hunters yet. There were no killing yet, but there were gatherers. They would go around and gather the fruit from the trees. And that's a pretty easy life because that's how they live in a very uh, lush, productive environment. And they don't need to produce all these other things. So they don't need to slave away to, to get their food. Abel keeps flocks. Cain works the soil. Now, in the course of time, please notice, we do not know how old they are when this happens. In the course of time, uh, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. Compare verses 3 and 4. Okay, this is a hint as to why uh, Cain's is not accepted and Abel's is accepted. Cain is bringing some of his, uh, of, of his fruits of the soil. Not necessarily the best, mind you, just some of it. Abel brings the fat portions. Now, what's the big deal about that? Previous to modern era, when fatness is looked down on, for most of human history, fatness was considered to be a sign of health and uh, prosperity. People who could eat enough to become a little fat were more secure, and they were, uh, they were considered to be more prosperous. Uh, they weren't starving, in other words. But um, the fat portions were considered to be the best portions, also because, well, frankly, often the, for some people, and this is not me, but for some people, the fat is the tasty portions, okay? So they're giving, from their own perspective, the fat portions that he's giving, Abel's giving, the best part. And he, not only is he giving the best, he's giving the first. Look at this. He brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. Now, this is the first indication of blood sacrifice. Now, I know there are some people who feel that God did a blood sacrifice, killed an, an, uh, killed an animal in order to provide skins for Adam and Eve to wear. However, remember that God has just created the whole universe, and the God who, who uh, created the skins that are on all the animals is perfectly capable of creating skins to put on Adam and Eve. There is no statement that he killed animals to provide those skins. Remember, we're talking about the creator. But here, Abel is providing the fat portions that you can't get the fat portions separated and distinct from the rest of the animal without, of course, cutting the flesh. And so there you have blood sacrifice. And he's sacrificing the fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. Now, you know, he's he's giving, he's giving the first born, which means he's not building up security for himself. See, he's, he's the firstborn. He's giving the first to God, and he's giving the best to God. And this is an attitude that Abel has that we need to also have. God is first. God is best. God is the greatest. 
God is the creator. He is the most powerful. He is the, the Lord of the universe. Yes, he's the, he's the greatest. He's the first. He's the best. And, of course, uh, he existed before anything else did. And so he's first in that sense, chronologically as well. God is first and best, and therefore deserves first and best from us. And Abel gives that. Cain does not. He just gives some. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look on favor. Now, why is that? Well, he's giving the first and best. Some people have said it's because Abel gave a blood sacrifice. Notice this is not a certain kind of Moses law, sin offering or bird offering. This is just an offering. It just means I give this to you, God. And if you want to talk about offerings in general like that, they did, Israel did have grain offerings, first fruit offerings. So the fact that it is from the soil, this is agricultural produce, does that by itself does not disqualify his offering. It is that it's just not his best or first. God is part of his life, but not first and best to him. Cain is very angry, and his face is downcast. God says to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? Now, the, this question, you know, when God says in the previous chapter, uh, where are you? Have you eaten from the tree? What have you done? These rhetorical questions that God asks, God is not seeking for information that he doesn't have. God is asking rhetorical questions. God is asking a question as well that a parent, this is our Father in heaven, that, this, that a parent might ask and say, uh, and say, why did you do that? And so to, to a child, what are you doing? So why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? And then God indicates that he knows what's going on, of course. If you do what is right, will you not also be accepted? See, God's not playing favorites. If Cain does what's right, Cain will also be accepted. It's not that Abel is better than Cain. It's that Cain is that Abel has done the right thing, and he has done what is right. And, and that's why it's accepted. And anybody else who does what's right will also be accepted. But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. Crouching. The picture is like a wild animal crouching, ready to spring. A panther, a jaguar, a leopard, a tiger, a lion. Think of the big cats who crouch like a beast, a beast in the jungle. Henry James wrote a story about a man who was always thinking that something big in his life was going to happen. He didn't know what, but it was going to be like a beast in the jungle that was going to leap out at him and change everything. And the question is, of course, that as he goes through his whole life constantly waiting for the beast in the jungle to leap, and it never does. And so he goes through his whole life anticipating, but the thing he anticipates simply doesn't happen. God says to Cain here, if you, that sin is crouching at your door, it desires to have you predator sin wants to get you uh, the, peter talked about this that the devil goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour satan does this and seeking to eat us sin is crouching at your door it wants to have you to eat you but you must master it every person james says in chapter one of the epistle the letter that James wrote. He said, sin is when people are drawn away by their own desires and enticed. Sin desires to have you, and your own desires draw you into sin. Sin is like, those desires are like the first generation, and sin the second generation, and death the third. The desires leap up, and let it, they, they grow up, when uh, lust, uh, when lust is con uh, conceived, it brings forth sin. When it grows up, it becomes parent to sin. And sin, when it is finished, completed, doing its job, brings forth death. That's a picture that God gives here. here. Sin is crouched and desires to have you. Okay, But 
You can master it. Eve did not master sin. Jesus gave example in his temptation. We talked about this in the previous session. And Jesus gave in his temptation the example of mastering sin and defeating temptation. But, of course, Cain does not have that example. He has instead his mothers of, of succumbing to sin, his fathers as well. Cain says to his brother, so Cain has received this warning from God who wants Cain to do well. God wants us all to do well. We can all be accepted. But Cain says to his brother, Abel, let's go out to the field. Uh, why does he do it out there? Well, they both have these outdoor jobs. You know, the modern office uh, is not, not yet been invented. And uh, one of them is an agriculturalist. One of them is a, is a herdsman, a farmer and a herdsman. And so they, they go out to the field. And uh, while they're in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Now, uh, one of the pictures that we get of here is of a rock, a big, just him grabbing a big boulder and smashing it onto the back of, of uh, Abel's head. And one of the Hebrew words implies that that is the, the style of this murder that takes place, premeditated homicide. And uh, the, the, there's a movie called Genesis, and, or In the Beginning, and uh, it shows uh, 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 Cain and Abel going out into the field and Cain doing it exactly this way of attacking, attacking his brother and killing him this, in this ex exact way. Now, the Lord says to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? That's that famous statement. Am I my brother's keeper? Uh, yes, you are your brother's keeper. You, and um, John chapter 8 talks about that. John 8, 44 uh, implies to this. The Lord says, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. The, the blood has, you know, Abel has died. He's been killed. His blood has been shed. The blood soaks down into the ground. It doesn't necessarily even mean burial, that he buried it. One uh, Dershowitz, an attorney who had grew up as an argumentative Jewish uh, kid in a, in, a, in a religious upbringing, says that this says that, um, that Cain is hiding the body to prevent it from being seen. And that's, not, that's, that's reading too much into the text. He just kills Abel, okay? And... Uh, and then the blood soaks into the ground, and then the blood contains the, the ground is the ground is containing blood, and that cries out to God. Now God says to Cain, "You are under a curse." Now Abel, Adam was punished in chapter three. Eve was punished. Both of them were punished in that they were going to have to work, and not only work, but they were, it was going to be painful. He was going to have to work by the spread of his sweat of his brow. She was going to bear children in pain. It was going to be travail, work for her to do that. And now, but they were not cursed. The ground was cursed. The serpent was cursed. But now here, Cain is cursed. You are under a curse and you are driven from the ground. Now, what is Cain's work? He has been working the soil. Now, what advance does Cain make on Adam in terms of the way they work the soil? First of all, it's possible that Adam just throws seeds out, casts the seeds. But Cain is working the ground, which implies digging in it. And so he may have seen Adam uh, cast seeds and seen the birds eat the seeds and, and fly off with them and said, well, I'm going to prevent the birds from, uh, from eating my seeds, so I'm just going to dig a hole, put them down in the ground, and then they will uh, come up. So there is a working the soil, digging in the soil, which is an advance on simply throwing the seeds and hoping that they'll, they'll sprout. The, you are now under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. Okay. 
and your brother's blood from your hand. Okay, you are your brother's keeper. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. So Cain is going to be exiled from his work that he has done so far. And he is going to have to keep, he's going to be a fugitive. He's going to be constantly moving, constantly running. That's the, the sentence on him. Now, Cain says to the Lord, Cain is not sorry, you notice, that he killed his brother. He is his first defiant. Why? Am I my brother's keeper? And uh, uh, Abel kept sheep. So the implication is that Abel is a sheep. And uh, I'm not a shepherd of Abel. I'm a farmer. I dig the soil. But it's a, but no, you're not a farmer anymore, God says. Not anymore, you're not. So Cain now says, my punishment is more than I can bear. Notice, this is not, I'm sorry I did this. Just, you're punishing me too much. I, I can't take it. Today you are driving me from the land. He's got that right. And I will be hidden from your presence. He's got, well, he's got that right in one sense. He cannot bring his, his uh, produce from the soil back to God as an offering there. Of course, in the sense of God's um, the presence, he's not separate from God's presence. But perhaps, but Cain apparently doesn't understand that. If he had understood it, he probably would have killed his brother because he would have seen that God sees that. And he, of course, now has come to realize that. Uh, but he says, but not totally, because he says, I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth. And that is the sentence, yes. And whoever finds me will kill me. Now, who's he afraid of? Some people have said, uh, since the only people on earth at this moment are Adam, Eve, and Cain, and uh, so Abel being dead now, so who else can he be afraid of? Well, see, the thing is that um, uh, Cain may not know that they are the only people on earth. He hasn't been to a lot of places, and so he may think that there are other people out there uh, like Adam, Eve, and himself. And uh, that's so, uh, how's he to know that they are the only ones anywhere? Then there's also the fact that what we now look at as being human beings and what we now look at uh, when we see um, a bipedal, uh, walking on two legs, uh, creatures with limited brain capacity, Homo erectus, and other creatures, you know, uh, Cain may have seen some of them, and modern evolutionists may say that is, that is a, 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 home, a, a form of Homo sapiens, a form of a, a hum, hominid, uh, but uh, God doesn't count them, and God says um, that they are not in his made in his image. Now, we've been over this back in previous chapters, but to be made in God's image implies a God consciousness, a God awareness, and uh, God has put eternity in the hearts of men. So, so they know, they know, uh, uh, they, this, is, this is being made in God's image. But Cain may not realize that if he has seen some other creatures that resemble human beings and he thinks they are human beings, if he's seen any of those, then that may be he who he's afraid of. The Lord said to, to Cain, said, not so. If anyone kills Cain, he will suffer vengeance seven times over. Of course, I'm sure that doesn't comfort Cain very much, but it says, says I'll still be dead. But... Uh, but God says, but then the part that may be more, a little bit more comforting to him is God put a mark on Cain so that who, no one who found him would kill him. So this is a protective mark. Now, what is this mark? There have been some people who, seeking to um, get an excuse for racism, have said that it's black skin or something like that. There is no indication here in this text what the mark is. It's just something that will prevent him from being killed. In the film, in the beginning, which I've cited already, the interesting uh, statement uh, is that the mark resembles a tree of life on his forehead. A mark on his forehead that resembles uh, the, tree of, the tree of life in the garden. 
again, that also is not uh, uh, is is not the speculation that's not proven. The Lord put a mark on Cain, and of course it doesn't say where on Cain that the mark is, is put, but anyway, that says, uh, that's the statement that it would be on his, the idea that it would be on his forehead is also speculation, uh, perhaps driven by uh, comments in Revelation about the mark of the beast and the mark of the Lord. Cain went out from the Lord's presence. So Cain had said, I will be driven, hidden from your presence. Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Nod means wandering, the land of wandering. So the wanderer left the Lord's presence and went east from there, from Eden. So they had been cast out of the Garden of Eden, and they had gone east of there, east from the garden, and now he's going further east. Now, uh, there have been some people who have suggested that this Cain's movement east and east again has. Uh, they thought that 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 the Orientals were the uh, the children of Cain. Some people thought that, and where would they get that from? Well. Uh, when you see Noah's kids coming out of the ark, and then you look in chapter 10 of Genesis and see where those people went, they cover, uh, they go all over the Middle East. Uh, you have people going uh, all the way up toward uh, southeastern Europe and uh, toward the, or all around the Black Sea and into uh, northeastern Africa, both the Arab, what is now the Arabic part and what is now the black part of northeastern Africa, and, uh, and then into western Asia. But the furthest east that it gets is the Zagros Mountains. The Zagros Mountains are a range running north-south through Iran, and there is no mention of anyone further east than that from the descendants of, uh, of, of Noah. Now, if you are going to say that the descendants of Cain are the ones who went further east and that they kept moving and wandering and kept going, uh, then you're going to run into a couple and that they are therefore the ancestors of the Orientals. You're going to have two problems with that. First, of the most obvious, is that... Uh, uh, you're going to have a, a flood that is not worldwide uh, because uh, the flood um, uh, has to, Cain, all of Cain's descendants would have been killed off in the flood if the flood's wor worldwide, as the Bible says it is. So if you're going to say that Cain is the ancestor of the Orientals, you have a, then you uh, inevitably have to say that the flood is a limited flood. And then, of course, you have some very specific scriptural references to indicate the opposite of that. And uh, so that's, the, that's your first problem with, with trying to maintain that. But I think one of the reasons people have thought that is simply because they couldn't figure out where else the Orientals came from, because the, the, the Orientals are a distinct racial group. And uh, on the earth, you know, the Negroid, the Mongoloid, Caucasoid ra uh, racial groups, and uh, yet there doesn't seem to be indication of them uh, among Noah's descendants. So they thought maybe it's from Cain. Uh, but uh, again, that, that has this problem. Cain lay with his wife, right? Where did Cain get his wife? And uh, there's these huge debates, the Charlie Brown Peanuts, uh, Peanuts comic strip um, has this uh, Charlie Brown and Linus talking together about something they saw on TV about people uh, having this huge argument about this. And then Lucy comes in and, and makes her normal inflammatory comments about, about the same thing. Where does Cain get his wife? First of all, you must know that Adam and Eve have other kids. Okay, and they have many, in the chapter 5, it says they had many sons and daughters. So Cain could have ended up marrying one of his sisters, if you feel that only Cain and Abel, uh, only Adam and none of the other creatures were able to mate with them. Okay, so 
then he would necessarily be uh, mating with his sister. And you may say, well, that's horrible. And, and of course it is. Moses' law says you must not do that. But please remember that even Moses himself, was his parents were half-brother, half-sister. And Abraham married his half-sister. So this kind of thing was not a crime back then. The laws hadn't about to been made yet. And uh, the first law was uh, that indicates that you shouldn't do this. this is the Moses law, but that, of course, postdates these examples of what had happened. So you can't read back into this earlier text uh, uh, a later law. And uh, as far as morality, is it immoral? Is uh, what we would now call incest? Yes, of course, we would say that's immoral now. But again, that's called that because God forbade it and said it was wrong to do that. And does it cause problems with the children? Yes, there are degenerative diseases that can take place when you marry a close relative. And uh, you will notice that Abraham and Sarah can't have kids, uh, and only miraculously are they able to. Uh, Isaac and Rebecca, who are first cousins, are not, are, uh, not able to have children for 20 years, and then Isaac prays and God grants them kids. Uh, Rachel is not able to have kids until she's later. So these people who were very close relatives, they did have some trouble having children. And uh, uh, But the um, Cain lay with his wife. If this is not his sister, then again we come back to other creatures who are maybe not made the same way but are able to cohabit with them. And there's plenty of that in nature. We see that happen. Uh, uh, there, was an, there was an elephant seal in California that was trying to mate with other seals, but he was having trouble procreating because he's so big and so heavy that whenever he would mate with these female seals, he would crush them to death. He was so much bigger than they were. So there is where, one of, uh, where you have a super superman or super seal characteristic, and who, uh, which you would feel is not a mutation uh, limiting him, but it's a mutation making him, uh, making him stronger and bigger, and yet uh, a very variety that makes it more hard for him to, uh, uh, to have kids. Now, Cain lived with his wife, and uh, she became pregnant. So this wife, uh, if, if, if the Neanderthals are another creation, separate from, and if, and if Adam, Eve, and their represent uh, Homo sapiens sapiens, or what used to be called Cro-Magnon men, and if this is the, uh, if Cain gets his dis wife from the, we do know that there was mating, now we know for sure, absolutely, that there was mating between the Neanderthals and the Cro-Magnon. Most of the Neanderthals were killed off, a few of them cohabited with the uh, modern man, and the result is that everyone on earth except the Africans have some Neanderthal, a little bit of Neanderthal descent in them. And so, uh, so the, uh, there are several options. Cain could have got, perhaps got his wife, his wife from his sisters, or perhaps from another race that had been separately made before on the earth. She became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Now there, here's a, there are a lot of different people with the same names in the Bible, and this is the first example of this. There is another Enoch who is a descendant not of Cain, but of Seth, who is the next brother, uh, next son of Adam and Eve. But uh, this Enoch is the, is the first Enoch, and um, now, Cain was building a city. Now, obviously, we're not talking about Tokyo or uh, Lagos, Nigeria, or, or uh, any other huge city. We're not talking about London, New York. A city here simply means a fortified dwelling, a, a strong house, okay, a, a permanent settlement which is fortified. And this tells us two things. He does not... He defies God, and he's not going to wander. He's going to stay in one place. You'll see this again at the Tower of Babel. 
but the first thing is he's defying God and he says, I'm not going to travel around. I'm going to stay right where in this one place. And so first of all, he's disobeying God. And secondly, he's not trusting God. Cain disobeys God and distrusts God. And when you disobey God, then you don't have a reason to trust him. You broke, you're breaking the covenant. Remember in the book of Judges, whenever they disobeyed God and worshipped other gods, then God said, fine, if you don't want to be in covenant with me, I'll withdraw my protection. He withdraws his protection. They suffer, and uh, this is the result of their uh, defiance of God. Cain builds this permanent dwelling, and he, a uh, strong house, he is afraid it's a fortified dwelling, okay? It's strong, protective, so that he can he can uh, protect himself from any of those people who he is afraid are going to kill him. God had said, I'm putting a mark on you so that anybody who sees you won't kill you. But that promise, Cain doesn't trust. This is the same Cain, remember, who defied God when God said, if you do what's right, you will also be accepted. He didn't believe that. He just decided to kill his brother. And now he doesn't believe God's promise of his protection. And instead, he's going to take that as well. He was taking his jealousy and envy into his own hands. And now he's taking his protection into his own hands. He names this settlement after his son, Enoch. And of course, that... the. The concept of naming something, showing your authority, is, of course, something that God did from Genesis chapter 1, and he delegated it to Adam to name the animals, and uh, and now Cain does the same thing, naming a town, a settlement, after his son, Enoch. And, of course, up to this day, people name houses, streets, towns, cities, states, nations, after other people. Rhodesia was named after Cecil Rhodes. Uh, so there's so many of these, uh, uh, so many nations or, or areas that have been named after certain people. Uh, Victoria Falls after Queen Victoria. The, uh, the, there's so many rivers and mountains and, and cities. Uh, uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, Washington, D.C., and so on. So we, um, Cain has named a settlement, and now to Enoch was born Erad, and Erad was the father of Mehojel, Mehojel was the father of Methushel, Methushel was the father of Lamech, aha, another Lamech. There are, there's going to be another Lamech you'll see later on. Now this Lamech married two women. This is the first case of bigamy. And uh, one of these women is named Ada, the other is named Zilla. Interesting that they are the, the, a, the a and the Z. Okay, maybe he felt he only needed to marry two in order to cover the whole alphabet. And uh, he named one Ada, named the other Zilla. Ada gave birth to Jabba. He's the father of those who live in tents and raise livestock. Now, Abel was herding animals. Okay, he was hurting them, not hurting them, but hurting them around. But Jabba has taken this further. He is not only hurting them, but first of all, he's living in tents because he's seen that as you get more and more animals, they will graze an area down, and you're going to have to move so to, to new pastures. So since the animals have to keep moving, and your, you, your job is herding animals, so what, what you do, what you do is that you uh, move with them. So what, how are you going to do that? Well, you uh, build a house that is, uh, that is portable, and that's what a tent is. So uh, they live in tents, and so they can follow their, their herds around and raise livestock. They are raising them, and the concept here is also perhaps breeding them. So, you know, even to this day, there are people who have cows uh, in the world, uh, cows with shrunken udders, and the uh, half-wild cows, and the uh, uh, herdsman has to persuade the cow 
to allow him to milk the cow. So he would give sweet grass to the cow and talk soothingly to the cow, and the cow says, all right, all right, I'll let you have some of the milk. So, but now we have bred cows to the point where uh, cows have such swollen udders and deliver so much milk that it hurts and they moo and moan and request to be milked. So the human beings have really altered the physical environment of the, of the planet in their own interests. And this is one of many, many examples of that. Ada has a brother. And uh, the brother's name is Jubal. So you had Jabal, who, was, who invented tents and invented breeding of livestock. And his brother is Jubal. He's the father of all who play the harp and the flute. Now, harp and flute, we're not talking about, of course, the Irish Celtic harp, that huge thing. And, uh, nor are we talking about the silver modern flute. Think of it as stringed instruments and wind instruments. This is a person who's just really talented in music and, and God has made human beings creative and talented. God is creator and he's made us in his image and we also create. Now, you know, when you create a musical instrument, you create that out of pre-existing materials, but when you create the music, that is more of an act of creation because that's, uh, that's something coming seemingly out of nothing. Now, of course, uh, Jubal has examples in the, in the world around him, songbirds. So he does, it's not created from nothing absolutely. There are, there is inspiration, but still there is a strong element of creativity there. As far as harp, harp and flute instruments are, oh, there are so many ways you can do this. Bamboo, you can hollow out bamboo and you can make a, a wind instrument from that reeds, hollow reeds of various things. You can make holes in them and you can, uh, and you can uh, make a flute pretty easily from, from hollowed out uh, plants. Or stringed instruments. You can take a branch from, and bend it and tie twine and at various lengths. You tie one twine and you bong, 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 or several in a row which will all be progressively shorter than the previous ones. And so you have a C-shaped uh, uh, bent that bent stick that keeps its tension, and then all these made out of uh, different kinds of uh, uh, twine to, to make the, the different sounds. Now right there you have, yeah, what basically is a harp, a stringed instrument. So um, now Zilla... That's, which is Lamech's other wife, she has a son, Tubal Cain, who forged all kinds of tunes out of uh, tools, out of bronze and iron. Now, again, we do not know exactly when Adam and Eve are living. And we'll get to the chronology in, in the next chapter. Uh, hold with me on that for the moment. But uh, we don't know exactly when these people are living. So to say that that uh, Tubal Cain is working with all kinds of tunes out of bronze and iron. How early is this bronze work? Because you see, even iron work, uh, I, weapons with iron were not made until, uh, in some of the earliest cases, maybe in the 1100 BC, or the Hittites, and uh, uh, 1200, 1300. And you, but by the time you get back to before that, you're dealing with bronze weaponry. If you think about... Um, uh, the Iliad and Odyssey, their weapons are made of bronze, and they uh, they uh, fight with with bronze weapons. Iron is rare, and con because it is rare, it's almost more like a precious precious metal. Like we don't make weapons out of rare metals because they're, they're you don't want to destroy them. They're they're too rare, and at the beginning, iron was like that. It was a rare metal, and so. Small things, small things that were made of a precious metal of iron, that existed before iron weapons did. Because to make an iron weapon requires that you just have a whole lot more of it, and they didn't have a whole lot more of it at the start. So uh, the benefit of iron over bronze is that it's harder. And if an iron weapon over meets a bronze weapon, other things being equal, the iron weapon will break the bronze weapon. 
And of course, that's why we went from the Bronze Age to the Iron Age. But uh, how early, I guess, this Tubal Cain was making some of, experimenting with some of the first alloys, some of the first uh, metalwork. Tubal Cain had a sister named Nama. Nama. Lamech says to his wives, okay, two wives with all of these creative, very creative, very inventive kids. Lamech says to his two wives, Ada and Zilla, listen to me. Wives of Lamech, hear my words. I'm going to tell you the A to Z of it, Ada to Zilla of it. I killed a young man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me, okay? Now, Basically, he's saying he's not a young man. I killed a young man. The young man is the other party. Okay, What did the young man do? The young man injured him, wounded him. So they got into a fight, and he got into a fight with this younger man. Who is this? Oh, that's another question, like Cain and his wife. Okay, But by now, we're talking generations later. Remember, we had... Uh, uh, Cain had Enoch, Enoch had Mehuchel, and uh, I'm sorry, Enoch had Irad, Irad, Mehuchel, Mehuchel had, and so on. So we're now several generations further down the line. And if all of these families are having lots of kids, then you have lots of opportunity for many more, for many more kids, uh, many more people to be involved in this. I killed a man for in wounding me, a young man for injuring me. So Lamech's boasting about this. He's boasting that he bettered beat and killed a younger, supposedly should have been stronger man. So Lamech says, if Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech is avenged 77 times. Now this is several generations further down, and he is, and the, the, the avenging of Cain has been remembered. Cain might not have believed it, but, it, but he was protected, and the result is that the protection has been remembered, and uh, Lamech is saying, I get, uh, I get avenged more. Now, why does he feel that he is worthy of much more vengeance than Cain? Uh, well, perhaps in one sense, uh, because uh, Cain had no good reason to kill Abel. If Cain, if Abel, if, if Cain wants to kill somebody, uh, uh Abel has done a better job, but it's God who accepted Abel. Let Cain kill God if he can try that. But it's a, but um, Cain has no good reason for killing Abel, and yet God protects Cain. So Lamech is saying, I had a good reason. This guy attacked me and wounded me, and I said, so I I I, I killed him. Now this escalation from kill uh, from injury to killing this is exactly the kind of violence that you see mentioned in genesis chapter 6 this is the kind of violence which is the reason why god brings punishment on the form of the flood on the earth and later the laws hammurabi's laws moses laws uh they try to keep things under control, the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, life for a life. This was to limit the punishment. In other words, you can't give a life for a limb. You can't escalate the punishment because when you do that, that's how these generational long-lasting feuds, the Hatfields and the McCoys and so on, the Montagues and the Capulets, these, these feuds that go on and on and on and keep escalating and more people getting killed. And um, so to stop that and to make the punishment fit the crime, they say only an eye for an eye, not more than that. See? So, uh, and here you see that somebody who wounds him, he kills. So he escalates the violence. And yet he says, I have a right to defend myself. And the guy attacked me. And so I, I defended myself. And uh, although he wounded me, I got better, the better of him. A young man, I got the better of him and killed him. But you can see what, what's happening and, uh, and, the, uh, and what's going to lead to the flood. Adam lay with his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth. 
So this is the sort of replacement for Abel, saying, God has granted me another child in the place of Abel since Cain killed him. Notice she is the one who is giving the names to the children. Adam gave the names to the animals, to his work. She gives the names to the children, to the family. He is the boss of the work life. She is the boss of the family life. Seth also had a son and named him Enosh. So, no, this is not Enoch. The other Enoch is coming in the next chapter. At that time, men began to call on the name of the Lord. What time? In that era, that's not an exact date, obviously, but at that time, at, uh, men began to call on the name of the Lord. Now, what does it mean to call on the name of the Lord? First of all, uh, what is the name of the Lord? Okay, at Exodus chapter 3, God says, when Moses says, uh, whom shall I say is sending me? Uh, 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 Mo God says, I am. And then Moses calls God Yahweh, he, me, which means he is. And God says to Moses, this name, Yahweh, is my name forever. And he says to Moses that I, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob did not know me by this name. They know me as Elohim. So uh, what is the name of the Lord that people are calling on here? Elohim or El Elyon or simply El this word El is the simplest, shortest, basic word, God. And it has been uh, added on to El Elyon, El Shaddai, Elohim. And then other languages, Baal is Be Baal, okay. And uh, Allah, okay. You see this basic, uh, shortest vowel, one vowel, uh, I mean one syllable, El which has been expanded in so many different ways in languages of the Middle East. And so people begin to call on the name of the Lord. Now you may say, well, L-O-R-D, capital L, O, capital O, capital R, capital D, is Yahweh. They begin to call, so they were saying that. Well, um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob didn't know this name, and yet throughout that story as well, the name is used in the story. So perhaps we can say that, um, just remember that this is Moses writing, and he's writing because he knows that name, and, uh, and he, he's aware of that name. But the, um, uh, another viewpoint is that the name is known at a certain time, and then it's forgotten. Or another way is that they may know the name, they may know the word, but they don't know what it means. They don't know God's name in the sense of knowing him well and in the sense of be having a, coming into that closer relationship with him. But to call on the name of the Lord, of course, to call, to use your voice, to speak that name, implies that there is a... Um, that, that there is a... Uh, uh, a, a voiced, an invocation of the name, a spokenness of the name. It is not just, a, and this is very, very important as we talk about baptism and speaking the name of God. In the New Testament context, to call on the name of the Lord has the, the, the same text in Joel, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. To call on the name of the Lord is used in uh, Romans to say, uh, that uh, with our heart we believe and with our mouth we confess. And uh, in that context, it talks about calling on the name of the Lord. And in, in uh, Paul's baptism, Ananias chapter, uh, uh, chapter 9 of Acts says to, Moses, uh, to, says to Paul, what are you going to be waiting for? Get up and be baptized. Calling, washing away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So there, baptism, calling on the name of the Lord is used for baptism because when we call on God's name, when we baptize, we are to speak God's name. And when we pray and confess our sins, we are to say to God that, uh, that we are repenting of our sins and we are to call out to God and, and declare with our mouth, with our heart we believe and with our mouth we confess. And finally, on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, uh, there Peter in his message 
talking about everybody receiving the Holy Ghost and speaking in other tongues, says, uh, he quotes from the same scripture in Joel, saying, uh, saying that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And this time, the reference is to speaking in other tongues as initial evidence of receiving the Holy Spirit. So we have, this, uh, we have these three instances, repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, receiving the Holy Ghost, all this examples of calling on the name of the Lord. Of course, the descendants of Cain and Abel don't know all that, but they uh, are they are hungering for God. They are crying out to God. They are beginning to call on the name of the Lord. They're beginning to pray. They're beginning to, to speak out God's name in prayer and to seek him again. It's interesting that we don't really see Adam and Eve doing that so much. Adam leaves God's presence at the garden, but then we don't see a lot of repentance from Adam and Eve. Maybe they just despair. Maybe they feel it's hopeless. And it's later generations who say, I can do something about this. I can begin to call out and begin to try to reach out to God and close the gap between the distance between God and human beings. So this is the end of chapter four, and we will come back to chapter five in our next session.